After his arrest, Courtney Lockhart, 23, was taken to the police station, where he confessed that he was the one who kidnapped and took Lauren Burke's life. The person you were just watching on screen is Lauren Burke. The unimaginable happened in the quiet college town of Auburn, Alabama, a community known for its strong bonds and peaceful streets. Lauren Ashley Burke, an 18 years old freshman at Auburn University, became the victim of a crime so heinous it shook the very foundation of this tight-knit community. On the evening of March 4th, 2008, Lauren was kidnapped at gunpoint, robbed, and ultimately tragically lost her life. This is not just the story of a young woman's tragic demise, but a sobering reminder of the fragility of life and the far-reaching impact of crime on families, communities, and the very essence of human trust. Lauren Ashley Burke was born December 30th, 1989 in Marietta, Georgia. He then called his ex-wife and Lauren's mother, Vivian Gershon, hoping that maybe she knew where their daughter might be. Lauren Ashley Burke was born on August 11, 1989 in Marietta, Georgia to James Burke and Vivian Gorshon. From an early age, Lauren's radiant smile and boundless energy painted the picture of a young woman with dreams as vibrant as her personality. A graduate of Walton High School, Lauren carried her passion for life into her college years at Auburn University. Here she found her place among new friends, embracing the college experience with enthusiasm. Lauren was described by her friends as a well-liked, excellent student, always smiling, happy, and helpful. Lauren was not just a student, but a beacon of positivity, actively participating in various extracurricular activities, including lacrosse and art clubs, showcasing her diverse interests and her willingness to engage with and contribute to her community. Her high school years were filled with achievements, both academic and personal, laying the groundwork for a bright future. After high school, they both enrolled at Auburn University, where they continued their relationship. Lauren's journey continued at Auburn University, where she chose to pursue a degree in graphic design. Auburn wasn't just a school to Lauren, it was a canvas of possibilities. Here, she immersed herself in college life, becoming an active member of the Delta Gamma sorority. Her sorority sisters became a second family, one that shared laughs, supported each other's dreams, and created memories that were meant to last a lifetime. Her car, a black 2001 Honda Civic, was parked in the parking lot next to the dorm, and she moved towards it. That was the last time Sean saw Lauren. Her passion for graphic design and photography was more than just a career path. It was a calling. Lauren saw the world through a lens of beauty and sought to capture the moments that make life worth living. Her artwork and photographs were not merely assignments. They were pieces of her soul shared with the world. He kept calling over and over and finally he heard Lauren's voice on the other end. She said she wasn't coming to the library because she'd forgotten all about the appointment. But Lauren's aspirations went beyond her artistic endeavors. She dreamed of making a meaningful impact and living a life filled with purpose and joy. Lauren's presence was a gift to those who knew her. Her kindness was a reminder of the good in the world. Lauren was lying on her back in the middle of the road, taking slow, deep breaths. She was suffocating. There were many wounds on her body and only socks on her feet. Her untimely death left a void that words could not fill. The loss of Lauren Burke is not just a tale of a life taken too soon. It is a story of what the world lost, a future artist, a beacon of kindness, and a cherished daughter and friend. Lauren's legacy is not defined by her death, but by the vibrancy of her life and the countless lives she touched. Courtney Lerol Lockhart was born on October 20th, 1984. In the words of his family, he was a nice, fun-loving guy until he joined the U.S. Army. He was sent to Iraq in 2004, from which he returned as someone else in 2005, according to his mother. He wasn't the Courtney I knew, his mother said. Courtney Lerol, Lockhart, born on October 20th, 1984 in rural Alabama, started a life that would tragically intersect with that of Lauren Ashley Burke. In 2003, Lockhart enlisted in the U.S. military, seeking direction and purpose. His service took him to South Korea and Iraq, where the realities of combat began to weigh heavily on him. Despite the discipline and structure the military provided, Lockhart found himself struggling, culminating in a series of disciplinary issues. Also in 2006, he was court-martialed for assaulting other soldiers, using illegal substances, and deserting his unit without permission. 
by 2006. Lockhart's military career was marred by infractions, including marijuana use, attacks, and threats against fellow soldiers, leading to his confinement and eventual dishonorable discharge in December 2006. A defense psychologist later noted that while Lockhart did not have a formal diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, he exhibited symptoms associated with his combat experience. Furthermore, assessments of his mental capacity revealed an IQ of 86, along with noted immaturity and poor judgment, painting a picture of a young man ill-equipped to navigate the challenges of post-military life. Following his discharge, Lockhart's life spiraled further out of control. Beginning in February 2008, he embarked on a violent crime spree across Alabama and Georgia targeting women in a series of armed robberies and carjacks. Lockhart's method was cold and calculated. He would approach his victims from behind as they entered their vehicles, brandishing a pistol and demanding their possessions. His crimes were not only marked by their violence, but also by their brazenness, including a harrowing incident where he threatened a woman with a firearm pointed at her three years old son's head. The crime spree culminated in a series of increasingly desperate acts, culminating in an attack on a 72 years old woman in a Walmart parking lot. The attack underscored the depths of Lockhart's descent, revealing a man capable of extreme violence and devoid of empathy. After his arrest, Courtney Lockhart, 23, was taken to the police station, where he confessed that he was the one who kidnapped and took Lauren Burke's life. The interrogation was videotaped and became a key piece of evidence at trial. As Lockhart's path led him inexorably towards Auburn, the stage was set for the tragic encounter with Lauren Burke. Unaware of the approaching storm, the community would soon experience a crime that would forever change everyone involved. The quiet evening of March 4, 2008, took a dark turn on the Auburn University campus. Lauren Burke, an 18-year-old freshman, was about to become the victim of a harrowing crime. After leaving her boyfriend's dormitory, Lauren intended to spend her evening studying at the Ralph B. Draffen Library, a plan that would never come to fruition. He became dizzy from the gasoline fumes, so he rolled down the windows to let air in from the street. Perhaps it had something to do with Lockhart's mental problems or low IQ, but we shall talk about that a little later. Courtney Lockhart, whose day had been spent lurking on the campus with malicious intent, spotted Lauren around 8 p.m. as she made her way to her black 2001 Honda Civic. With a Rome RG revolver in hand, Lockhart confronted Lauren, coercing her into the passenger seat of her car under the threat of violence. Lauren, in a desperate attempt to calm him down, handed over $200 in cash, pleading for her freedom, a plea that Lockhart coldly dismissed. You might be wondering why he didn't drive to the campus first and doused Lauren's car with gasoline there. Why did he drive on a powder keg, since a short circuit or spark could have caused the car to burn up with him to see if the car had burned all the way down? Investigators began to question whether all of Lockhart's testimony was true. As they drove away from the campus, Lockhart's demands grew more disturbing. He ordered Lauren to remove her clothing, claiming it was to prevent any attempts to escape. Throughout the approximately 30-minute drive, which meandered past the familiar sights of Auburn's bars, stores, and restaurants, Lockhart vented about his life's failures, while Lauren, in a state of unimaginable fear, sought to negotiate for her life. She offered to help Lockhart find employment. A gesture of empathy met with Lockhart's grim insistence that he was beyond help. The situation escalated when Lauren's friend and boyfriend attempted to contact her. Lockhart, aiming to maintain control, forced Lauren to fabricate a story, further isolating her in her moment of peril. It was a conversation that, in hindsight, would haunt her loved ones. Your child's safe and to do everything they can to keep your child safe. I don't care if they're 18, 19, 20, 21, they're still our children. Ultimately, Lauren's attempt to flee resulted in Lockhart discharging his weapon. The bullet struck Lauren at close range, causing fatal injuries. She managed to exit the vehicle and seek help, but was too grievously wounded. Passersby found Lauren and emergency services were called, but despite their efforts, she succumbed to her injuries at East Alabama Medical Center. Secondly, uh, we have located a gas can in the downtown area of Auburn. We are sending that to the lab to get it tested to see what was actually in the gas can and to for any DNA that might be on the can. I know that's one thing that's uh, come up. Also, finally today, I have some pictures prepared for you that we'll give you at the end of this conference of a, a vehicle, 2001 Honda Civic, that is similar or just about exactly like uh, Miss Burke's car. What I'd like for you to do is distribute that out. 
and anyone that has seen this car in the Auburn area on the Tuesday night, please give us a call. No matter how important you think it is or is not, uh, please call us and make us aware. In the immediate aftermath, Lockhart's cold calculation continued as he sought to erase any trace of his heinous act. After leaving Lauren Burke grievously injured on the road, Lockhart's escape took him to a Chevron gas station on North College Street. There at 9.17 p.m., he coldly utilized Lauren's stolen credit card to purchase gasoline for $14.65, a transaction that marked the beginning of his attempt to obliterate the physical evidence of his crime. Defense attorneys never denied Lockhart committed the crime. Instead, they focused on his time in the Army, a man suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Jurors decided Lockhart meant to kill Burke from the moment he kidnapped her, robbed her, and forced her to remove her clothes. We're glad that the trial is over and justice has been done in the name of Lauren. Losing a child is like having two, carrying two stones in your pockets at all times. You get used to the weight but the weight is there all the time. All right, the man who committed this murder has been convicted. He's done. Don't even want to talk about him. But let's talk about the responsibility that universities have. And in this case, Auburn, did they have a responsibility to do more to keep her safe? With the purchased gasoline, Lockhart proceeded to Burke's black 2001 Honda Civic, now parked in the desolate Hinton Field parking lot. His intentions were clear, to set the vehicle aflame and destroy any lingering evidence within. However, his initial efforts to ignite a fire proved futile, prompting him to seek out a Burger King bag, intending to use it as an accelerant. The scene at the parking lot was a macabre tableau of Lockhart's desperation to cover his tracks. He pilfered $46 from Lauren's purse, along with her iPod and her credit card, ensuring he had funds to facilitate his fleeting escape. Yet, in a grim oversight, he left behind Lauren's clothing, the remainder of her cash, and her digital camera, perhaps in his hastened state to flee the scene. Determined, Lockhart set the car on fire, this time successfully, watching as the flames began to consume the evidence of his barbarity before making his escape from the campus. Lockhart's flight from accountability didn't end there. Satisfied that the fire would erase his ties to the crime, he ventured north on Interstate 85 toward Atlanta, Georgia. In a continued abuse of the stolen credit card, he purchased more gasoline in LaGrange, Georgia at a Kroger store only to discard the card as if discarding the remnants of his crime. He came back to Alabama, ending a terrible journey. It started with an unbelievably violent Violent act and left a community and a family forever hurt by what was lost. Firefighters and police were immediately sent to the address the callers gave. Unable to find the owner of the burning car among the crowd of curious students attracted by the fire from their dormitories, police checked the license plates and discovered that the owner of the car was someone named James Burke a resident of Georgia. The Auburn community was left reeling after the tragic ending of the life of Lauren Burke on the evening of March 4, 2008. The Auburn Police Department, recognizing the urgency and gravity of the crime, initiated an exhaustive investigation. The hours following the discovery of Lauren's body and the burned remnants of her car were critical, setting the stage for a complex and thorough inquiry into the events of that fateful night. The investigation began with a meticulous examination of the crime scene. Forensic experts scoured Lauren's vehicle, from the flames for any evidence that might point to the perpetrator. Simultaneously, law enforcement officers canvassed the area, gathering testimonies from potential witnesses who might have seen something unusual around the time Lauren was abducted. When he saw a man walking toward him with a gun, he quickly got back into his car and then watched as a man changed directions and approached an elderly woman who was getting into her car after exiting the store. The woman later said the man hit her in the back of the head, then stuck a firearm to the side of her head and that he told her he was going to kill her and take her money and car. He shoved her into the passenger side floor and then took her wallet. He then got into the driver's seat and backed out of the parking lot in an attempt to leave. But the witness began to follow the man which freaked him out. The assailant then jumped from the woman's car and got into a silver Chrysler. Key to the breakthrough in the case was the analysis of surveillance footage from local businesses near the crime scenes. A crucial piece of evidence emerged from a Chevron gas station on North College Street where a man, later identified as Courtney
Courtney Lockhart was captured on camera using Lauren Burke's credit card to purchase gasoline at 9.17 p.m. shortly after the homicide. This transaction not only placed Lockhart in the vicinity, but also linked him directly to the crime through the use of Lauren's stolen credit card. She was murdered. She went away to school, to Auburn. And did Auburn do everything that they could to keep her safe? Further investigation revealed a pattern of erratic behavior and a trail of transactions made with the stolen credit card across Alabama and into Georgia. Each purchase provided law enforcement with a timestamp and location, helping to trace Lockhart's movements after the crime. The meticulous cross-referencing of this data with witness accounts and surveillance footage from other locations formed a cohesive story that pointed unequivocally to Lockhart as the suspect. Law enforcement agencies across Alabama and Georgia were put on high alert as the search for Lockhart intensified. The decisive moment in the investigation came when Auburn police, coordinating with other law enforcement agencies, identified Lockhart's vehicle and initiated a traffic stop on March 7, 2008. What began as a routine procedure quickly escalated into a high-speed chase as Lockhart, realizing the noose was tightening, attempted to flee. During this chase, he even threw out his firearm from the window in order to leave no evidence. Dale Richards, a police officer in Phoenix City, eventually arrested him. His arrest was the result of arduous investigation work that involved collaboration between various jurisdictions and the application of contemporary forensic techniques. Upon his arrest, further incriminating evidence was uncovered. Officers found Lauren's iPod and cell phone in Lockhart's possession, along with .38 shell casings and a blood-stained t-shirt in his car. These items, coupled with Lockhart's confession to the homicide of Lauren Burke and his admission to committing other crimes, solidified his connection to the brutal events of March 4th. His erratic journey in the hours following the homicide, characterized by a desperate attempt to destroy evidence and escape justice, ultimately led to his capture. The arrest of Courtney Lockhart not only marked a significant achievement for law enforcement, but also began the process of seeking seeking justice for Lauren Burke. It was a testament to the dedication of the Auburn Police Department and their commitment to solving a case that had deeply affected the community. When Lockhart was arrested on Friday, he basically waived his rights and decided to make a statement to police. He saw Lauren Burke forced her into her car while on the campus of Auburn University, robbed her, then drove her around and forced her to take off all of her clothes. Courtney Lockhart's arrest led to an immediate and intensive interrogation by law enforcement. During these sessions, Lockhart, faced with the overwhelming evidence against him, confessed to the abduction and ended the life of Lauren Burke. His admission during the interrogation provided a harrowing account of the crime. During this interrogation, Lockhart provided law enforcement officers with a detailed confession, which was meticulously recorded on video. This recorded confession was later presented to the jury at trial, offering a direct and unsettling insight into Lockhart's actions and mindset on the day of the crime. In addition to the video recorded confession, Lockhart provided officers with a signed handwritten statement that offered a chilling recount of the events leading up to Lauren Burke's homicide. His statement was, On Tuesday of March, I am not sure of the date, but I was in Auburn, Alabama, and I was on uh, Auburn University campus, and I rode around the Auburn Opelika area all day, and that night I saw my victim, Lauren, and I ran up to her while she was getting in the car, and I pushed her in the car and told her to give me her money, and I got in the car with her and just talked to her. Then I drove her car off with her in it and was just riding and I told her to take off her clothes and we kept riding. We were talking about how my life was over and how she could help me get a job and then after riding for about 30 minutes we headed back to Auburn University campus and on the way back we were still talking about my situation and how she could help me and I was telling her that she couldn't help and that this was the end for me. And the gun went off and she jumped out of the car and I went to turn around and at the turnaround point there was already another truck turning around, so I just went straight to campus, but I stopped and filled her car up with gas. On the way to campus, I hear people standing on the street saying somebody's car is leaking gas, and I let the windows up and headed straight for campus. Set the car on fire, left, went to fuel my car up, then went back to campus to make sure the car was burning saw that it was, then headed to um, Atlanta. In addition to all of this, I threw her debit card out of the window on I-85 South, and I left her car keys in the car, uh, in the ignition, and I also left her phone in the car. On March 9th, 2008, Lockhart gave authorities one more statement. He told them that he had been working for a contracting company for a year, 
and had been on a job site in Auburn. Right when it got dusk, I left and rode around to campus. Everybody was outside. I rode around campus for about an hour. I parked in the same parking lot as before and was talking on the phone. I parked there for a while. I see Lauren getting into her car. She's already got her door open. She is doing it so slow. I get out of my car and walked over to her behind her. When I saw Lauren, I hung up the phone, grabbed my gun, and came up behind her. I told her to get the f car. I asked her, how much money do you have? She didn't say anything. She was still screaming. I was sitting in the driver's seat and she was in the passenger seat. I was just sitting there and she finally calmed herself down. This second statement reiterated Lockhart's sense of desperation and his futile attempt to seek help from Burke before ultimately deciding to end her life in a moment of panic. These confessions, both the video recording and the handwritten statement, became focal points of Lockhart's trial, painting a vivid and harrowing picture of the crime. Lockhart was indicted on multiple charges, including murder during the commission of a robbery, kidnapping, and attempted violation. Lockhart's trial, beginning on November 8, 2010, was marked by its complexity and the emotional weight it carried. Prosecutors focused on the evidence at hand, including Lockhart's confession, the items found in his possession post-arrest, and the surveillance footage linking him directly to the crime. The defense, in contrast, aimed to introduce Lockhart's mental health issues and his troubled military history as factors mitigating his culpability. Significantly, Lockhart's defense argued that the shooting was accidental a claim that stood in contrast to the prosecution's portrayal of the homicide as a calculated act. A critical element of Lockhart's defense strategy was to highlight his military service, specifically his deployment to combat zones in Iraq. The defense argued that Lockhart's experiences in combat significantly impacted him, leading to lasting psychological effects. They presented evidence suggesting that Lockhart suffered from a mental disease or defect as a result of his military service, which purportedly made him incapable of appreciating the nature and quality or the wrongfulness of his act. Defense attorneys never denied Lockhart committed the crime. Instead, they focused on his time in the Army a man suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. This defense aimed to establish that Lockhart did not intentionally cause Burke's death. Instead, they argued that Lockhart's alleged psychological state prevented him from fully understanding the consequences of his actions, which further complicated the accidental firing of the fatal gunshot during a time of increased stress. The judge, however, was unconvinced by the defense's argument regarding the accidental nature of the gunshot. In evaluating Lockhart's actions, the judge specifically cited his military experience and training, suggesting that someone with Lockhart's background would unlikely discharge a firearm accidentally under the circumstances described. This assessment cast doubt on the defense's portrayal of Lockhart as a victim of his mental condition and military-induced trauma. From what I understand was advised from a federal committee uh, that went to the school to review the safety and security of the school and they paid a good amount of money for this report and they were advised what they should do. And for some reason, Auburn didn't follow their direction. That's number one. Number two is there were video cameras in the parking lot where my daughter was abducted. And if there were video cameras, where was the person monitoring those cameras to see what was going on in that parking lot? And then finally, um, the third point is uh, this, uh, I don't even know how to explain my thought on this fella, but this, this monster was there in the morning waited all day for a prey nobody showed up he left he came back backed in to the parking so nobody would see his license plate. Moreover, the judge took into account Lockhart's dishonorable discharge from the military. This aspect of Lockhart's background contributed to a complex portrait of the defendant, one that challenged the defense's narrative and suggested a pattern of behavior inconsistent with their claims of diminished capacity. After over six hours of deliberation, the jury found Lockhart guilty of robbery, kidnapping, and capital homicide. The jury rejected the defense's argument for accidental shooting and dismissed the claim of attempted violation. The jury voted unanimously, 12-0, to recommend life imprisonment without parole for Lockhart. This recommendation reflected the jury's assessment of the case, taking into consideration the severity of the crime, Lockhart's background, and the circumstances leading to Burke's death. 
Lockhart faces three capital uh, murder charges for murder during a kidnapping, murder during a robbery, and murder during an attempted rape. However, in a decisive move, Judge Walker overruled the jury's recommendation on March 2nd, 2011, sentencing Lockhart to death by lethal injection. Walker cited the premeditated nature of the crime and Lockhart's criminal history as key factors in his decision, emphasizing the particularly heinous nature of Burke's abduction from a college campus where she should have felt safe. Following his 2010 and 2011 convictions and subsequent death sentences, Courtney Lockhart embarked on a prolonged legal battle, seeking to challenge both the verdict and the penalty. His journey through the appellate court system underscores the complexities of the legal process, especially in capital cases, and highlights the ongoing debate over issues of mental health, trauma, and justice. Now the man convicted of her murder says his defense wasn't good enough. Lockhart's first appeal to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals was a critical attempt to overturn his conviction and death sentence. In August 2013, the court issued a 196-page opinion affirming the trial court's decision. This comprehensive document stated, the record reflects that Lockhart's sentence was not imposed under the influence of passion, prejudice, or any other arbitrary factor. We determine that Lockhart's sentence is neither disproportionate nor excessive to the penalty imposed in similar cases. This ruling underscored the court's view that the trial process had been fair and the sentence appropriate given the gravity of the crime. Undeterred, Lockhart sought a rehearing with the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals, which was denied in April 2014. This denial led him to escalate his appeal to the Supreme Court of Alabama, which, in September 2014, also denied his petition, leaving his conviction and death sentence intact. In January 2015, Lockhart took his appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States, the nation's highest legal authority. However, in April, the Supreme Court declined to review his case, effectively exhausting his immediate appellate options. Lockhart's legal team, supported by the Equal Justice Initiative, then pursued a Rule 32 petition, a move aimed at challenging his conviction and sentence based on alleged errors during the trial and the ineffectiveness of his defense counsel. Filed in September 2015 and amended in May 2016, this petition raised several allegations, including the failure to present critical evidence related to Lockhart's military trauma and its impact on his mental state at the time of the shooting. A significant aspect of the Rule 32 2 petition was the request for expert re-evaluation of the firearm used in the homicide, arguing that the original trial attorneys had not adequately explored evidence that might support Lockhart's claim of accidental discharge. Prosecutors refuted this claim and insisted that there was no good reason to doubt the findings of the state's forensic experts. Despite these efforts, on April 3, 2020, Judge Walker denied Lockhart's request for relief from his conviction and death sentence. The denial was based on a thorough review of the evidence and the arguments presented, reaffirming the court's confidence in the original trial's outcomes. Lockhart's subsequent appeal of this denial to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals resulted in another setback. In April 2021, the court let stand his capital homicide conviction and death sentence, marking the end of another chapter in Lockhart's post-conviction appeals. As of today, Courtney Lockhart remains on death row at the Holman Correctional Facility, a testament to the enduring nature of his legal battles and the finality of the judicial system's decisions. The tragic end of Lauren Burke's life left a profound impact not only on her family, but also on the Auburn University community and beyond. The aftermath of this devastating event triggered a series of actions aimed at seeking justice for Lauren, addressing campus safety concerns and commemorating her life. In the wake of Lauren's homicide, her family took legal action against Auburn University, advocating for significant changes in campus security measures. The Burks filed a claim arguing that the university's decision to merge its police force with the city's police force resulted in inadequate security that could have otherwise prevented Lauren's tragic death. They sought $1 million in damages, a symbolic figure representing their call for accountability and enhanced safety protocols. However, in November 2014, Alabama's Board of Adjustment denied the claim, leaving the family and supporters disappointed but undeterred in their quest for systemic change. Throughout the legal proceedings against Courtney Lockhart and the subsequent appeals, Lauren's parents remained steadfast advocates for the death penalty, viewing it as a just response to the irreversible harm inflicted upon their daughter. At a hearing in 2018, Lauren's mother poignantly stated, he didn't give her a second chance. He shouldn't get a second chance either. This sentiment was echoed by her father in 2019, who affirmed, we maintain our desire for the death penalty. 
Lauren did get the death penalty without a hearing, and we will do anything it takes to continue this process. Even if it goes to the Supreme Court, the Burke family will never give up. These powerful statements reflect the depth of the family's grief and their commitment to seeing justice served. The case of Lauren Burke has sparked significant reflections on campus safety, the legal proceedings surrounding violent crimes, and the broader debate over the death penalty. It underscores the critical importance of vigilant security measures in educational institutions and the need for a legal system that adequately addresses the complexities of justice, punishment, and rehabilitation. Lauren's legacy is remembered not only in the context of her tragic death, but also through the lasting impact she has had on her family, friends, and the Auburn University community. Efforts to honor her memory continue with calls for enhanced safety measures, support for victims' families, and the preservation of Lauren's spirit through scholarship funds and memorial initiatives. Lauren Burke's story is a call to action for all of us to engage in ongoing efforts to ensure community safety, support the enduring fight for justice, and remember the precious lives lost to senseless violence. It challenges us to reflect on the values of remembrance, justice, and community safety, urging us to contribute positively to creating a safer, more compassionate world. How can we, as a community, further honor Lauren's memory through actions that ensure the safety and security of all students? And in what ways can we support families affected by similar tragedies in their quest for justice and healing? Hit the subscribe button for more thrilling stories.